Looking for the latest security news hot off the presses? Well, you're in the right place. This is WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security news each week. I'm your host, Corey Nockreiner, and this is the episode for August 6, 2012. As has been the case lately, this was a very busy week for security news, but I'm going to limit this week's episode to three security stories and information about a few upcoming patches, simply because my voice is giving out. But if you want details about a few other stories I'm not covering in this episode, be sure to check out our WatchGuard Security Center post with this video. One of the most talked about security stories this week was how a journalist named Matt Honan was hacked largely due to some bad security policy implementations from some major cloud providers. On Monday, Honan told the sad story of how a hacker wiped his MacBook, his iPad, and his iPhone device, causing him to lose many, many personal files, including unrecoverable pictures from his family. When this happened, Honan contacted Apple to try to figure out what was happening, and he ended up unraveling a very complex story on how an attacker can use flaws in various cloud services to gain unauthorized access to user accounts. Without going into all the details of how Honan figured this all out, I will say he did end up contacting his attacker over Twitter and learning firsthand how the attacker gained access to his accounts. And it was a very complex attack. Long story short, the attacker was after Honan's Twitter credentials. He just liked uh, Honan's Twitter name and wanted to steal the account. So the attacker first used Twitter to find Honan's personal website. By visiting that personal site, the attacker then learned Honan's Gmail address. With the Gmail address, the attacker could then use Gmail's account recovery services to learn alternate email addresses Honan used, including Honan's at me.com account, his Apple account. By using Whois on Honan's personal website, the attacker could also get the billing address that Honan uses for the website. So this now gave the attacker multiple email addresses Honan used and his billing address. This is actually a lot of information that you need when you're contacting cloud service providers to do things like password resets and stuff like that. However, the attacker was still missing some information he might need to use to validate Honan's credentials to these cloud services, including perhaps the last four digits of a credit card that Honan uses. But the attacker had a way around this too. Apparently, Amazon allows you to call up and add credit cards to your Amazon account. All you really need to do this is the Amazon username, the email address used for the account, and the account holder's billing address, all of which the attacker already had. So the attacker then went ahead and called Amazon, used these credentials to authenticate himself, and he added a credit card number to Honan's account, which is pretty easy to do. There's a lot of fake credit card generators on the internet that will give you a fake credit card number that uh, authentication service will actually authenticate as valid. So once the attacker had added a new credit card to Amazon, he could then call Amazon again and say that he had forgotten his password. And when this happens, Amazon does use the last four digits of your credit card to help you authenticate your account. But once you do this, they allow you to put a new email address into Amazon. And the attacker then used that email address to do a password reset. And at this point, he had full control of Honan's Amazon account. Once the attacker had control of the Amazon account, he could actually go and scroll through any other credit cards that Honan had added to Amazon, including the real credit card. Now, unfortunately, the exact information that Amazon freely gives away, the last four digits of a credit card, is the exact information that Apple uses on the telephone to authenticate and validate their users. So he calls up Apple, he gives him Honan's email address, Honan's billing address, and the real last four digits of Honan's credit card, and pow, he has full access to Honan's Apple account. Once he had uh, access to Apple's account, he basically used iCloud to wipe all of Honan's devices. The only explanation the attacker gave for why he wiped all of Honan's devices was to make it harder for him to try to recover his accounts. And it had the unfortunate uh, side effect of deleting all of Honan's 
Ryan's information, which he didn't back up. Because many of these cloud-based services are linked and you use one cloud services authentication to log on to other services like Twitter, for instance, the attacker gained a lot of access to, to Honan's cloud services, including Twitter. So this was a very good illustration of how attackers can use all the personally identifiable information we share with various cloud services to eventually put together enough information to actually take control of our accounts. This doesn't even get into the, the issue of some of the security questions we use for password reset recovery and how attackers can use information from social networks perhaps to get into those. So it's a very, very eye-opening illustration for those that don't realize the problem with sharing such personal information with the internet. Once you put it out there, it's there forever. So what are the takeaways or learnings we can have from this? Well, first of all, Honan admits that he made many mistakes. Uh, first of all, you should definitely always back up your important data. Otherwise, it could be wiped forever, like in Honan's case. He also mentions the danger of linking your various cloud services or accounts together. Uh, Facebook, for instance, allows you to connect to Gmail and so forth. Doing this, while it has some convenience, it also adds some security ramifications. If an attacker can break one account, he may have access to others as well. So it can be very dangerous. However, it also highlighted some of the bad security practices and policies of some of these cloud services. In one case, Amazon, a piece of information they shared freely, was, was used as a validation credential for another cloud service. And for instance, Gmail's account recovery, if you have one email address, you might be able to get an alternate email address from the account recovery settings, and so on and so forth. So many of these problems have to be fixed by the cloud providers themselves, and news is, Apple and Amazon have already acted to kind of close some of the holes these attackers used. But for you, I'd say be very careful what you share online, avoid linking accounts, use different passwords everywhere and very strong passwords, and make sure to back up. If that security story wasn't big enough, yet another one surfaced later this week. On Thursday, one of WatchGuard's security partners, Kaspersky, released details about yet another supposedly nation-state-sponsored advanced persistent threat. During their investigation of the flame malware alongside the International Telecommunication Union, Kaspersky found yet another advanced persistent threat called GAS. They've released very detailed research about this new APT, which I'll put on the WatchGuard Security Center post for this video. However, to summarize it, it is essentially another variant of flame. It's at least based on many of the same modules from the flame malware. And Kaspersky suspects uh, flame, Dooku, Stuxnet, and GAS all come from the same author or nation state. Like previous instances of this uh, nation state malware, GAS seems to be targeting Middle Eastern countries, specifically Lebanon in this case. It's very similar to Flame in some of the ways it infects users once it's on your network. In fact, it uses the same USB spreading mechanism that Flame uses. Uh, Kaspersky still doesn't know how it initially infects the network though. As far as they can tell so far, GAUS doesn't have any sort of uh, zero-day vulnerabilities built into it that weren't previously discovered. But it does have some interesting facets. First and foremost, GAUS seems to be banking-related malware. Once it infects a system, it starts monitoring your internet traffic looking for banking transactions, specifically to many uh, Lebanon-specific banks and Citibank and PayPal. It also does things like monitoring email and instant messenger and Skype as well. So some people propose that this might be a way for some nation states to gain more insight into what's going on in Lebanon's banking system, since apparently the U.S. government uh, suspects various terrorist groups to be using this banking system. The last interesting tidbit is GAUS actually stores a very well-encrypted file or module on the USB device of its victims, which Kaspersky calls an unknown warhead. Kaspersky and other researchers have not been able to decrypt this warhead, so they don't know exactly what it does yet. However, many suspect this is the payload that Gaz is set to deliver only when it finds a very specific victim. In any case, you can find a lot more information about Gaz and Kaspersky's write-up, and I recommend you check it out as this sort of nation-state-sponsored attack seems to be becoming a more regularly occurring incident. There's no perfect way to protect yourself from this or any other malware. You, of course, should use AV and make sure 
it's up to date. Kaspersky's antivirus, which we use in some of our products, is very capable of, of catching this guy's malware. On top of that, uh, one of the organizations researching this malware named Crisis has figured out an interesting new way to detect whether or not you have gauze on your system. Among other things, gauze installs a, a pretend font on the systems it infects. And the Crisis re researchers know a way that you can use web style sheets to actually detect fonts on computers visiting a website. So they've posted a website you can visit with your computer to see if you're infected by gauze. I'll be sure to include links to all these references and these various sites in the blog post associated with this week's video. The last quick security story I want to share is a spear phishing campaign against a popular uh, cloud-based payroll service. ADP Payroll is a popular uh, payroll service which a lot of companies subscribe to to pay their employees. This week, researchers discovered emails seemingly targeting ADP customers. The email comes masquerading as a normal ADP email and it warns the customer that their certificate is about to expire and it provides a link they should click on to fix this problem. Now, of course, the link points to a site that tries to exploit a Java vulnerability to, to load malicious code on this victim's machine. Now, if you have uh, email security and anti-spam appliances, such as Spam Blocker, which comes with our XTM appliance, or our XCS content security appliance, those should prevent this type of email from going into your network. But in any case, if you're an ADP customer, you should be very leery of any ADP emails you get in the next few weeks, and be suspicious before clicking on any links in those emails. So let me end this week's episode by quickly warning you about some upcoming security patches from two big companies. Next Tuesday is Microsoft Black Tuesday. So first of all, Microsoft will release a bevy of security patches. According to their notification post, they plan on releasing nine security bulletins, and five of those security bulletins will be critical. They'll fix problems in products like Windows Office, Internet Explorer, SQL Server, Exchange, and a couple other products. On top of this, Adobe shares the same patch day as Microsoft, and according to their notification, they plan to release a big critical security bulletin for Adobe Reader and Acrobat X. So if you use a Windows computer, you probably have a bunch of these products, and even if you have a Mac, uh, some of these Adobe vulnerabilities also affect Mac as well. So in both cases, be sure to check back to WatchGuard Security Center on Microsoft Patch Tuesday for information about how to get all these updates. Well, that wraps up yet another exciting week of cyber hacks, nation state malware, and security updates. If you're interested in more regular security news, I recommend you follow our blog, WatchGuardSecuritySecurity.com. I'll be sure to put some reference links in this post talking about other stories that I wasn't able to cover in this video. You can also follow me on Twitter. I'm at SecAdept. As usual, thank you for watching, and at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you. Thank <laughs> you.